two men journey to the bars and restaurants of Scandinavia to find amazing beers, always with the same question. Hey, what's on tap? It's time to find out. Welcome to What's on Tap podcast. I am your host, Stefan. I'm your host, Martin. Right. And today, we have a little different. Food. We're doing our first book review. And food review. And food review. And so we have the, and I will say this, my Swedish is flawless. Boken on Ull och andra goda grejer. Yeah, very good. All right. So how would you say it? Uh, so it's Stig Birgit's Boken om Ull och andra goda grejer. Yeah, so exact, exactly no, what you said. Not too bad. Exactly what you said. So we have a cookbook. But you know what it means, right? Uh, yeah, it's the book of beer and other good stuff. Exactly. You, you, you know it. Yes. We can. We, now we can. Now we turn the, the show to Swedish. Yes, it's, it's going to be pure Swedish from now on. <clears throat> um, and so what we have is a cookbook mm-hmm. and a brewery book. And uh, when we were offered a chance to review this, I was like, let's do this. This sounds yeah. like a lot of fun. Uh, so Stig Baguettes, a uh, Swedish brewery that we know and love, yeah. um, they have worked with a guy by the name of, um, I think it's, I don't know, was it Marcus or Niels? I can't remember which. Hold on one second. I got to look in the beginning of the book. I don't remember. Anyway. Mr. Man. Mr. Man. Um, so anyway, the book is two parts. It is one part beer. Yeah, Marcus uh, Junkala is the um, uh, is a cook and baker and sommelier uh, for twenty years. Uh, something about Trappist in Belgium and uh, works in fine many fine restaurants and uh, focus on uh, food, as you would expect from a mm-hmm. cook and baker and sommelier. Um, so what's important here is that this is Stig Brigette's brewery book. So if, you, if you're a home brewer or if you're wanting to duplicate the recipes that Stig Brigette creates for your own and then repackage them and then call them your own, you can do that as well. So uh, the book itself goes into a lot of details. It talks about malt. It talks about hops. It talks about... Uh, water and yeast and the brewery process um, it goes into packaging and it just it water um, equipment your water equipment and uh, the different steps in the brewing process and some techniques yeah techniques it goes into um, bottle brewing versus kegging um, there's actually a water table in here that you can use to uh, make sure your water balance is right, to correct for minerals based on the parts of Sweden that you're in. I, I really like that uh, uh, chart. Yeah. So, so any home brewer who, who uses the, the uh, app Beersmith uh, will have an option to add their own water as a an ingredient. Mm-hmm. So the, the Beersmith has all of these common... Uh, grains and hops and yeasts uh, from the major suppliers but the water thing you kind of had to add yourself yeah. with the how many parts salt and uh, chloride and like all of these variables that differ wildly within at least Sweden mm-hmm. so so having some kind of reference to add into that application will the app will actually suggest changes to your recipes based on the water profile. Yeah. And what's really nice about this is if there's a stick that gets beer that you like, it's probably in here. So, I mean, they've got the, the Julius, which is the um, the Julius uh, clone, clone yeah. uh, from um, Treehouse. Yeah. Uh, it's got the Bird in the Hand, who's yeah. an IPA. It's got Bootsy. You've got um, uh, Gatton. Yeah, the Imperial IPA. Yeah, uh, so your IPAs are covered. You've got some loggers in here. You do their Pilsner. The Cuddle Monster. Yeah, You've got yeah, some Belgian Ales. Uh, you can do triples. Even their sour beers are in here. So, I mean, stouts and porters. Um, personally, I'm a big fan of the uh, Trouble Sleep. 
So it's like it's a see. coffee stout, right? Um, yes, uh, yeah, I believe so. Yeah, it says coffee. I say yes. I see it uh, across the table. Yep. Yep. Yeah, but so, so the, the recipes are made for home brewers, right? You would, yes. you would make a twenty or thirty liter batch uh, uh, from this, I presume. No, 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 okay, so here... I think it's a 15, because I think everything's 17.5 Here it says 10 liters for the Tsar Cockerel. Yeah, I think they're all 10 liter. I've never had the Siegberg Tsar Cockerel. Really? It's pretty good. Huh. Um, So yeah, you can, I mean, everything's 10 liters here, so it's kind of for the home brewer. Um, That's nice. That's good. And there's just so many brewing tips and and, and tricks in here. Uh, It talks about adding adjuncts. And what those do for for a beer, um, and then uh, in the back half there are recipes. And while as much as I enjoy the first half of the book, which I think is extremely informative and very interesting, I feel the back half is lacking a little bit <clears throat> because Tigrigets is a Yotaboy based um, brewery. I feel like the recipes are a little rooted in that particular area. Yeah. And I say that only because there's certain things like um, uh, certain seafood recipes that would be very difficult to duplicate um, if you weren't in in that particular area. Uh, I think that um, thanks to the uh, the fish church yes. up there, which is a, a pretty well-known fish market, Getting things like oysters and getting things like um, um, uh, uh, sea, sea crayfish, sea crayfish, yeah, Bec- yeah because lingustines, he- yeah, things like that are, are pretty, you know, clams, mussels, things like that are pretty easy to get. Um, however, in southern Sweden, it's a little more difficult to, to come by. Even if you go to the, you, you would the get the more Dora, mass, you would get the more mass produced right. crayfish. Yeah, then they're usually already cooked. Um, but then the, uh, sprinkled in between these recipes are some really cool ones, uh, like the the beer bread. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of these. Uh, some of the recipes really fit the tone and the nature of the book. Yeah. And some kind of don't. So uh, uh, Stefan has just opened a page of confit duck, which is a cool recipe. But it's difficult to make. Extremely difficult to make. This is one of those recipes that's you may not ever be able to make because where exactly. are you going to find confit duck from? Yeah, and it has no beer relation at all. Yeah, that's actually my. And then here's one for a uh, uh, a chicken sandwich. Um, again, my problem is there's no relation to beer. Like I would have liked to have seen like uh, more beer used in the recipes. So if you're going to, you know, uh, make a chicken sandwich, well, why don't we make it a beer battered chicken sandwich and not a exactly uh, what do you call it a um, uh, it's probably uh, using uh, katsu zando. Uh, what's it called? It is uh, a katsu zando. Yeah, yeah, it's a katsu zando, but I'm trying to think of panko breadcrumbs. Yeah, right. So instead of using yeah. panko and doing a dry breading, why not do a beer battered uh, chicken sandwich? I agree. You know, the falafel, it takes like two and a half days to make. Yeah, because the stuff has to rest for six to 24 hours. Exactly. And also falafel comes from a non-beer drinking uh, region and culture. Right. So, so, so yes. If you're going to make the flatbread, that literally takes 24 hours to make. So, I mean, there's certain things like, why not tell me up, up front how long it's going to take, the, take me to actually make something? That, that would be really, really helpful on this. You you get to the the you need to read the recipe to really know how really how many days to, yeah. you need to prepare for. And at the bottom, it recommends a beer, but what I like to see is recommend me a Stigbergets beer, and then you know, a, or a stout or porter or a lager or something. But tell yes. me the Stigbergets beer that should go with this. So so maybe someone in the the creation process said. Oh, it'll be too much selling out if we just recommended Stigberger beers. And I think my recommendation, I think yours as well, would be: well, then recommend us one Stigberger beer and one 
readily available alternative and you would get around the the self-marketing aspect. I don't even care. This is legitimately it is, yeah. the Stig Brigette's brewing beer. I expect it to be heavily tied together. Yes. Like, matter of fact, I want them to tell me, like, how can I use Stig Brigette's beer in cooking? And how can I, um, and what beers, uh, Stig Brigette's beers, should I pair with this? You know, because if I can't get, say, a particular beer because it's not in season, at least I know something equivalent I could I could put with it. I agree. And now yeah. you've uh, flipped the pages to the part where there are cocktails. So in the back there are some cocktails. Um, and again, it recommends a, a light lager with uh, Oloroso Sherry. I said just recommend a Stig Burgett's Pilsner. Right. So why would it? Why, why wouldn't you just say Stig Burgett's um, uh, Cuddle Monster? Or well, Cuddle Monster is an Imperial Or, or lager, Stig Burgett's right? Pilsner. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So, so, uh, yeah. Or uh, what is Oloroso Sherry? Is that easy to get? I don't know. I've never actually gone to a stumble log and tried to purchase Oloroso Sherry. No, that's true. Um, so it's like, it feels like some things are a little more difficult than they need to be when there's so many recipes out there that would be very fitting to um, the Swedish lifestyle and the everyday Swede uh, to be able to really enjoy uh, some of these uh, recipes a little bit more. Definitely. But the book has a lot of humor in it. It does have a lot of humor. Which I do uh, yeah. enjoy. Now we're getting into what we actually made for food and what we right. ate. But, so, the, but some of the recipes, the recipe we made contains a passage that says, put your oven at 220 or 220, uh, 235 if you have a bad bullshit oven like I do, the recipe maker. Yeah. The, the, that's such a weird and fun addition that yeah. actually makes it more fun. But there's a lot of humor and there's a lot of kind of tongue-in-cheek stuff. But at the expense of knowledge that should... Like I'm expecting to see in a cookbook, yes. in a modern cookbook. Yes. Um, so today what we made was the Fleska steak sandwich. And um, it had uh, two components we had to make at home. The rest you could uh, purchase. So it was a, a Fleska steak. Um, with uh, mustard, mayonnaise, um, pickled uh, cucumbers, yeah, etc. But we skipped that. We, what was that? What we what did we miss? What? Which one? Which one? Four to eight. Uh, unsweetened buns. Oh, okay, uh, the buns. Yeah, so we got, so we got of some. either low or high quality. Do not try to serve this with any kind of brioche. Right, we didn't use brioche. We used uh, potato buns. Yeah. Um, and then we had red cabbage and we had uh, a Swedish apple. Um, and so it, there's a recipe for how to make the fleska steak. And then there's the recipe for the uh, red cabbage, yeah. which we made. We made both of those items. And um, it, 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 it did have a separate bonus item, the alternative red cabbage made Danish style, where you add some kind of uh, red uh, black currant lemonade and you smoke an entire, not a pack of cigarettes, but an entire box of cigarettes. Nice. <laughs> uh, in traditional Danish style. And the picture is a uh, seagull, seagull smoking a cigarette, making this red cabbage. Uh, right. so, so it has a lot of humor. Yes. It's very tongue-in-cheek. Um, and so Fleska Steg, if you are not familiar with this, if you're not from Scandinavia, uh, and you're wondering what the hell is this, this would be a um, the center-cut pork loin with the layer of fat and skin on the outside of it. And the way you cook it is you, uh, you cook it with the skin side down in water, in a water bath for like um, half, an hour. half an hour. And then you flip it and you let it cook for another half an hour um, under uh, like 220 degree heat, 235 degree heat, I think uh, something like that. While basting the the skin and the fat right, with, with the with the salty fat water that has accumulated, um, and then what happens is the fat kind of becomes gelatinous and renders out a little bit. The skin becomes really crispy, and uh, it's really the part that you fight over. Yeah. Um, if there's any little bits left around, and then at the very bottom you have the the meat part, um, and so when you combine the all of it together, you have the the sweetness of the red cabbage, you have the spiciness of the mustard. You've got the um, the rich fatty protein of the pork, and then you have the 
the tartness of the uh, pickles. And then this one called for thinly sliced um, apple. Yeah. I don't know that the thinly sliced apple was really necessary. I don't think it, it, didn't, it didn't add that much. It really didn't. Um, but I would say overall, it was pretty good. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it turned out uh, really well. It was, you know, we, we, we followed the, the recipe exactly like they said. And it, in about an hour, everything was done. The pork had to rest a little bit. But overall, yeah, it was really good. We did do a super tiny bonus when the when the the pork came out, the 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 skin and the fat wasn't crackled enough. So we did put it in for like two or three minutes right. we turned on the, the on the grill feature of the oven. Right. So we turned the broiler part on or the yes. grill part on, and we just put it underneath the yeah the hot uh, part and just let the skin kind of bubble and crack. And that's really what you want is that really um, not burnt but you want it very very uh almost like a uh what do you call it uh pork skin uh yeah chicarones is in what you would call it in the u.s but it's okay uh it's the pork fat with the skin that you buy in the little packages yeah what's that P called pork rinds pork rinds, pork rinds. yeah kind of like that uh, but you could easily do that step with a hand held burner yeah, yeah, I mean, you could like do it like a brulee, like a brulee kind, yeah. of, kind of thing, like a blow with the torch. It, would, it was just a super, super small finishing touch. Yeah. Um, but the recipe was, I mean, it was a great meal. Yeah. Um, we really nailed the, the crackled okay. parts of the fat. And so the beer, I'm sorry, the, the book calls for you to drink this with a, a dark lager, a Vienna lager, or an English bitter. So we took matters in our own hands and paired it with uh, Stigberget's own uh, Ringobroi Maibok. Yes, this is a 7% Maibok, um, which I think falls into that dark lager, Vienna lager kind of area. Um, anyway, it, it pairs well with the, with the sandwich. It, it was good together with it. Mm -hmm. I would have preferred to just get that recommendation from the book. I would too. Because that way I can know exactly what to go out for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the more, when it comes to cookbooks, the less I have to think and the more it tells me, the easier it makes it my life. Yes. Um, and so if you take away that ambiguity, it, it makes things much simpler um, uh, for, the, for the reader. And like I said, I think that's where the cooking part really falls a little bit. Is it needed to be a little more specific on things? Uh, yeah, so you need to be a better chef. Right. Then we would want to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. if you didn't know what you were doing, I think you may be lost at points. And there were even points where we were questioning, um, do we do this or do we do that? And then we read over the ingredient, the instructions again, and we're like, I think they mean this. Yeah. And uh, so then it kind of uh, came together. Yeah, there was one point in the cooking of this pork where we were, we were actually questioning ourselves because the, the recipe specifically said, to fill up water to a specific level so it covered the the, 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 the skin, skin, the skin rind. and rind. And then after the allotted amount of time in the oven, mm -hmm. we were supposed to flip it and then fill up with water up to a two centimeter limit. Mm -hmm. We were above that. We, we did not fill up any water. And then you wonder, like, there's a step here that... Me, me, is meant for us to yeah. fill up water to a certain amount. We are all we start at the amount, but we've followed the recipe to a letter. It's almost like should I drop water in there and then re-add water, exactly. but I'm like not anything. Or we something wrong and should we throw everything out? No, we probably didn't. No. Uh, it's those kind of small details. But I'll give the book one really big plus. What? And that's the physic I mean the setup of the book the, right the pages are not connected to the back of the book right so the spine is the spine. connected to the the book itself so this is actually one of the the better things I've seen with uh, a cookbook because that means that when you open it to a particular page it just lies it just lies flat you don't have to fight the book to stay open it will stay open and then you can just read and do whatever you want to do um, because a lot of times when you have the the spine is attached. You have to really fight to crease the, break the spine, as they yes. say. Uh, but in this period, you don't have to do that. And then it just folds over. And I, I think that's a genius. I, I hope more cookbooks um, adopt that uh, particular style. Yep. Um, all right. So let's talk about the, the Maybach that we have. We can't, 
have a uh, a beer episode where we don't review the the beer that we're trying. It's it's malty, it's bready, it's what I would expect from a a lighter book. Beer. Yeah, it's got a little bit of a bitterness to it, which I think is is pretty nice. Um, um, yeah, it's a it's adequate. Uh, I think it went really well with the sandwich. It helped the the lightness and the the, the slightly bitter tones help cut through the richness of the fattiness of the sandwich itself. Um, so I'd probably give this a three point five. Me too. It worked better with the the fatty sandwich than it does now on its own. Yes, I have to agree with you there. And the book, out of five, what would you give the book? 3.75? 3.75? I would actually give it a 4.25. Oh, so high. I, yeah. I bashed it too much. No, I think that the brewing aspects, and this is probably what the book is for. It feels like it's the a book I'm is really it. there to present the uh, the Stuber Gets um, recipes yeah. and introduce people into the brewing concepts. Um, I think the, like I said, the addition of the broken spine that allows you to open things up and really get into it and read things is really nice. Um, it feels like uh, the food part is an afterthought. Like, hey, we've got all these recipes. It sounds like a lot of fun, but um, the let's just throw some food pairings on the back that don't really have any connection to the first part of the book. Yeah. And I think that's where it really falls apart is if it just bridge that gap it would have kind of made a, a really nice symbiotic hole it would have been a, an amazing cookbook um so yeah i'm gonna give it a what i say you said 425 four, and i've i think 425 is i've right. been convinced to increase it to four all right so four four two five um if you see book and om Ol on the the store shelves um i would highly rate especially if you're a huge fan of stick briquettes i think you would uh, really enjoy this cookbook I think you would really enjoy uh, the home brewing aspect of this. Uh, you should definitely uh, pick this up. Yes. All right. Um, you can find us at, uh, at whatsatappodcast.com, Instagram, Spotify, Facebook, uh, YouTube, uh, iTunes, yes. uh, the voice inside your head. Mostly the voices inside your head. And wherever you find the podcast. Next time, keep drinking the dumb dogs.